tackling it from a rescue perspective, I thought, I got to get to the root of this problem. Like, why are so many dogs abused, abandoned, neglected? Why is the euthanasia rate so high? Why won't they adopt pit bull type dogs out to regular families? This is the all-American family dog, right? Yeah. So um, I put a lot of research into that, and I worked with some of the other larger organizations in the U.S. and other um, nonprofit organizations to see kind of um, how I could collect some data. And what I came to find is that some of the reasons these dogs were being euthanized, surrendered at such alarming rates in comparison to others was... Welcome back to the Building Belmont podcast, or welcome to the Building Belmont podcast if it's your first time. We have some awesome organizations and, of course, people in our community, and it seems like those people are are representing our community more and more every day in different organizations or different projects and, of course, different passions that they have. And so we talk about growth on the podcast. We talk about the type of people that we're attracting. And today I'm joined by Sarah Andreco, who is the executive director of the American Pitbull Foundation and actually the founder of the American Pitbull Foundation. And you reached out to me on Instagram saying, hey, can we share about what we're doing with this 5K, which the 5K had me, uh, shelter dogs to service dogs, veterans with PTSD, everything about that just hit very close to home for me. So I thought absolutely we need to have that conversation. And as we were getting talking here before the podcast, I knew, all right, we just have to jump in. I'm already so intrigued. So Sarah, thank you for reaching out. Thank you for scheduling the time to be here with us. And thank you for taking some time to tell us about your organization. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm really glad that you invited me to be here. I, I happened to cross your Instagram channel by happenstance, really. And I was like, oh, this is great. I need to reach out and get my roots into this community a little bit deeper, and I thought this was the perfect way to do it. So I'm really happy that um, this kind of clicked with you in terms of what we're trying to do and what we're trying to bring to the Belmont community in general. So thanks. Yes. Well, we're really glad to have you. Like I said, when we talk about our growth, the people that we have in Belmont, and obviously I'm uh, partial. I'm not from here either, uh, but uh, again, love the community, obviously building a platform around it to serve it and connect people here. And so to meet someone like you, I'm like, oh, wow, we're neighbors. This is amazing. Yeah. So tell me about the American Pitbull Foundation. You said you founded it in 2010. There are some other operations that you have within that, but tell me about what inspired you or led to the American Pitbull Foundation. Sure. So um, early, early way back uh, when I was working in veterinary medicine, I was taking on a lot of Pitbull type cases of of neglect and abuse and abandonment. And um, unfortunately, at the time where I lived, they weren't allowed to be adopted. They were euthanized on site at the shelter system. And this was a huge problem. Um, and so what I did at the time was rescue dogs. I would take them in. I would spend all my money on them. I'd have a dog in every room of the house. And it's kind of like lopping off the head of the dandelion. They just come back full force. Or here in Belmont, the Carolina horse nettle. Ugh, you know, you, you cut off the head and they just grow back tenfold. So I did things the wrong way first. You know, I was like, rescue's the answer. I'm just going to rescue as many dogs as I can, get them into good homes. And that was my introduction to behavior initially. Um, but it didn't work. I burnt out hard. I spent all my money. You know, my family was kind of in crisis at the time because I spent all my time with the animals. Um, I took on everyone's problem, and it was never good enough. In public service, when you offer a free service, it's amazing how many people, you know, jump down your throat that it's never enough. So... Mm -hmm. I burn out, crashed, and then gave myself a good year break before my brain started bubbling again, and, and I just couldn't stay away. I had to do something. Uh, so instead of tackling it from a rescue perspective, I thought, I got to get to the root of this problem. Like, why are so many dogs abused, abandoned, neglected? Why is the euthanasia rate so high? Why won't they adopt pit bull-type dogs out to regular families. This is the all American family dog, right? Yeah. So, um, I put a lot of research into that and I worked with some of the other larger organizations in the U S and other, um, nonprofit organizations to see kind of, um, how I could collect some data. And what I came to find is that some of the reasons these dogs were being euthanized, surrendered at such alarming rates in comparison to others was a lack of education and a lack of resource. So when I founded the American Pitbull Foundation, I wanted to provide that that I wanted to provide a bridge for that gap. So what resources can I provide to the community? What information can I put out there? How can I help these people that feel like they have no other choice but to surrender an animal? How can we reduce abuse and neglect? And that's where I started to target my focus and that's how APPF came to be. You are a certified behavioral professional. Correct. By yes. trade. Yes. So again, what, what's the link here to what you're doing now with APBF? 
And, uh, you know, for having that profession, was it something that you saw, okay, I, I can use this here? Or do, have you created that link? I, I'd assume so, obviously, in training yeah. the dogs and, of course, supporting the veterans. So behavior actually was sparked from the work that I did with the organization. So earlier on, I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one with owners. You know, um, again, that was part of kind of that data collection process. Why are you wanting to surrender your dog? So a lot of shelter intake diversion. And in talking one-on-one -on -one with these people, most of the time it was behavior related. It wasn't abuse, it wasn't neglect. Um, some of it was just straight ignorance, not understanding basic dog-to-dog -dog communication. And so I would work with these people one-on-one -on, -one on a volunteer basis and s essentially solve these problems. I'm having a baby, okay, we don't have to get rid of the dog, here's how you introduce a baby to a dog and vice versa safely and appropriately mm -hmm. so they'll have a great relationship growing up. Or I'm moving and I can't take my dog. That's a huge problem, there are a lot of breed bans, unfortunately. So we started compiling apartment lists and housing lists and going through all of these lists for people to guide them where they could live with their animal without being discriminated against in terms of a living situation or without having to fake having a service dog or fake having an emotional support animal to get into a, a residence. So with the behavior work, it really started with this one-on-one -on -one work that I did with owners to help them solve the problems that they were facing. Some of it was financial, some of it was medical, most of it was behavior. Um, my dog is trying to bite visitors when they come in the house, or my dog tries to bite the vet, or my dog pulls on leash like a freight train and I'm pregnant, I can't have him pull me over. These are all things that we can solve and we can fix, but these are all reasons that people are walking into shelters and looking to hand that leash over. Yeah. Even handing that leash over and understanding that means that dog's not gonna make it out alive. So I just really started you know, digging into that and trying to help these people one-on-one -on -one while continuing my education that I already had onboarded, but just furthering that. Um, and that became a huge passion. So unfortunately, small nonprofits don't pay bills very well. So on the side, I started growing my, my side hustle, my, my behavior business, and I started offering consulting services on the side as well. So I still do some of that work with the organization, but it's not the main component to what I do because my goal is impact, you know, impacting the masses. So they do intertwine. And a lot of the education that I put out there for clients and for veterinary staff and hospitals and dog trainers, that also gets relayed in nonprofit. And that's also still helping people keep their families together. Absolutely. Well, why veterans? Oh, excellent question. Um, just like pit bull type dogs, which obviously have my heart, right? It is such a misunderstood population of underserved individuals. I mean, our veterans, you know, when they're active, when they're in service, you know, the military has their back, so to speak, you know, they get what they need when they need it. They take care of them. They come home and it's like, you're on your own. You're not feeling great. Here's a bunch of drugs. You know, it's going to numb the pain. It doesn't fix anything. There's not, it's kind of like prison reform. You know, it's punishment based. It's not reform based. Yeah. You know, we aren't helping them to change or to cope. And in-service life, even for veterans that have never seen a day of combat, is so starkly different from what civilian life is and trying to adjust to that, that it's unbearable sometimes. And there are, um, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of research on what treatments work and what do not. And service dogs are one of those treatments when aligned appropriately work very, very well. There are things that dogs can do that human to human, we cannot. And so we put those dogs in those roles. And with veterans and bridging them with pit bull type dogs, it's, it's kind of a beautiful happenstance to where you have two underserved populations, two very, um, there's a lot of, you know, uh, misalignment. There's a lot of stereotypes yeah. involved with both of those categories of people. So um, being able to put a pit bull type dog that is incredible at their work and at their service in the hands of a veteran, um, I think that's a really powerful thing. And not to say that a golden retriever is not a powerful thing in terms yeah. of their help, but um, it really speaks to them to be able to have one of them in their own care and working for them in the way that they do. Yeah. Well, I can speak to the uh, misunderstanding of a veteran or a misunderstanding of a pit bull. And, yeah. you know, on their surface, they look very strong and tough and sometimes scary, but truly, you know, some of their reactions and responses are actually from fear. 
yeah. uh, or anxiety or for past from past trauma. And I mentioned that you know your organization hits very close to home for me. One, growing up uh, very poor, pit bulls were typically the types of dogs that we had because they were widely available and we, we loved our dogs, always extremely loyal. And then having served for eight years and then also being in law enforcement, you know, some forms of mild PTSD yeah. and you know things that again you just don't know how to process, but certain things are just soothing. And you know, I love spending time with my dog. She's uh, not a pit bull. She's an English Mastiff, uh, oh, about two, about 130 pounds, but she is awesome. And again, there are just certain things that a dog bring out of you uh, to to connect with. And so, like you said, being very misunderstood uh, or mistreated or, again, being underserved, uh, being able to bring these two things together, I just really love that part of the mission. But I, I do know, and we're going to get back to that because you have a, a fundraiser that's coming up, the Rescue Me 5K, October 22nd, and we'll get more information on that. There are other things that you do with within the American Pitbull Foundation or other pillars or other branches? What are some of the other uh, humanitarian efforts that you have within the organization? Sure. So one of my favorites is the Humane Education Program. I love education. I love kids. Um, and we have curricula that's developed for um, ages uh, or school ages, pre-K all the way through high school. So pre-K is obviously shorter sessions, 30, 45 minute one-offs here and there about responsible dog ownership, um, how to greet a dog safely, uh, because that's, that's a, unfortunately something that children aren't really taught. So all the things that they don't get growing up, we try to teach them within that time limit. Our high school kids get longer programs, um, anywhere from five weeks to 11 weeks. And we get it more into depth with things like disease and prevention, just things that you don't typically get. But the focus is responsible dog ownership. So we're teaching the youth how to grow up and avoid situations that lead to dog bites, dog attacks, statistics that we really don't want to see with, with family companions. Um, so that's kind of the core of our humane education program. We have advocacy, which kind of ties into that. So creating content and creating education to get out there to the masses. We also use our advocacy segment and our advocacy volunteers to fight breed specific legislation, which um, as historically we have seen, um, it doesn't matter how loud we shouted, it wasn't going to work. You know, different municipalities had to try it anyway. And sure enough, it was a Band-Aid fix that reared its ugly head and um, festered and got infected. So now breed bans are being repealed. But advocacy is, you know, it's myth busting, not just in terms of our pit bull type dogs, but dogs in general and what responsible dog ownership looks like and what communication with dogs look like, you know, breaking down terminology like alpha dogs and outdated, you know, training practices. That's all part of our advocacy program. So it's just educational content for the most part. The third program that we have is outreach and outreach serves the underserved populations. And most of the time, these are people that can't find us. We have to go find them. So we do have advocates that kind of go door to door or people are referred to us by other people or by neighbors, by churchgoers, things like that to where there's a dog that's suffering or in need, but the family just doesn't have the ability to care for that animal necessarily. So instead of removing that animal from their home, we do what we can to try to keep them together. So as long as it's not an abusive situation, it's simply a lack of resource. Um, and a lot of these families are super wonderful and grateful and the dogs thrive really well. So if they're on a chain, we build them a fence. If they need vaccines, we vaccinate them. We need heartworm and flea preventive, we do that. We try to do whatever we can to get them on their feet. And then of course our Fourth and final program is our Shelter Dog to Service Dog Program, Operation Sidekick, which is um, that program that we talked about that is going to benefit from the Rescue Me 5K, which um, in that program, we basically rescue, raise, and train pit bull type dogs for veterans with PTSD. So it's very niche in terms of what we train them for. So Operation Sidekick, you're taking in the dogs and shelter to service. Are there any other services that you provide that help to take in these dogs uh, to help give them a home or uh, place them? You mean in, in terms of like running adoptions? Sure. I mean... Um, like rescue and adoptions? Yeah. So let's say that you have a dog that you take in for a shelter to service. And maybe this is another question. If they cannot become a service dog or they don't take to the training, or you see that, hey, this is a dog that just needs a good home. Is there any type of uh, adoption or foster fostering that you do with the dogs, uh, any type of shelter or anything like that that you do to actually take them in other than turning them into service dogs? So low key, yes. Okay. <laughs> Do not call me with a dog that you found, please. <laughs> um, so all of our dogs for the program are rescued. Sometimes, so let me back up. We aim for pregnant females because we can start with the dogs at three weeks of age. We can control the environment that she whelps in. Um, but we will start with anything up to a week to two weeks of age um, in terms of newborns. So that's, that's our ideal catch is a pregnant female with the right temperament. Sometimes we take in adults if we only have enough funding for one rather than 
five or 10, <laughs> you know, we'll be like, okay, let's go assess some of the dogs and see if anybody has kind of what we're looking for and we'll pull them. Well, that's a big risk. Uh, pulling an adult dog or something that we don't control right from the start, um, there's a high washout rate for that. And a washout means a dog that doesn't make it essentially. And washout dogs actually make really excellent family companions. Now I will tell you, we wash out at least 50% of the dogs that we rescue and take in. So those are available for adoption. That and we always take care of moms. In fact, the last litter that we pulled, we actually pulled mom and dad and all of the puppies. So wow. he came along with us too because he was on death's doorstep with their overpopulation issue. Um, but mom gets treated. Uh, so far, 100% of the time, all of our moms have had heartworm disease. So we'll take care of that heartworm disease, get them spayed, get them current, get them healthy and adopt them out. Um, every once in a while, we'll have a vet call or one of our volunteers will want to foster. So we'll pull an extra one in and we will privately adopt it out. But you can't find our adoption link. It's hidden just because we don't want people to think that we are a rescue agency. So yes, we rescue dogs, but it's not, um, it's not an adoption program like most of the rescues run in the area. Mm -hmm. um, and interestingly enough, uh, most of our dogs wash out of the program because they're too social. <laughs> Pitties have a tendency to like love everyone and everything when they're brought up appropriately. And um, I always I always laugh when someone tells me that they're loyal because they're not. If you've got a cheeseburger or you look like fun, they're like, bye. <laughs> 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 so that's that's been our biggest problem is just sociability. So for those dogs, we will kind of uh, cultivate um, their own desires and what they want to do and push them into something like therapy work or being a facility dog because they enjoy that. If they don't want to just service one person, we can find something else for them to do or we can adopt them out. And when you adopt a washout service dog, you've got a really well-trained, really well-socialized animal. It's a really good start. So do you partner with other organizations that will do those other things like adopting out or rescuing or having links where they actually... Uh put the dogs up for adoption. What, what does that uh, relationship look like? Obviously there's a lot of synergy, I think, with what you're doing in some of these other organizations. Are there any in the area specifically that you more intentionally partner with to kind of do what you do best and outsource the rest? Yeah, so um, we partner with Charmack Animal Care Control. Most of our dogs we pull are from there. We've pulled from Rowan, but we don't really partner with them. Gaston is a more recent um, relationship. When I first started doing rescue, uh, the Gaston County Animal Shelter was very different than it is today. So more recently, I've gotten back in touch and we've developed more of a relationship, so I'll be working with them. Um, but we also work with a lot of private rescues. So halfway there is where our last uh, service dog came from that we paired. But if we have washout service dogs that need adoption, we will try to adopt them out based on you know, people that we know in the community that maybe need a therapy dog or need a service dog, or uh, not a service dog, sorry, um, a facility dog, there we go. Uh, but if we don't have any active applications, we're not going to keep them in-house. So we'll reach out to Halfway There or Safe Haven or North Mac or Charmack and say, hey, do any of you have any applications that might fit this dog? You can take the application fee or you know the adoption fee. We just want them in a really good home. Yeah. So we try to facilitate that. But yeah, we have some really great rescue partners in the area, not only that we bring dogs into for the program, but also will partner with us to help get some of our washouts adopted out. Okay. Well, that's awesome. Obviously, again, a lot of organizations that are doing things more specifically. And so I was curious to see how you, you know, worked with them. Now on the other side of it, the veterans that you train to take on the service dogs, how do you find them or how do they find you? So there has to be a referral. Um, we learned very early on the hard way uh, what the term stolen valor means. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was not familiar with that one, um, but we learned the hard way. And so when we first started this program, I realized that we bit off more than we could chew, thinking that we could appropriately um, intake and filter and match veterans, so the person side of it, with the dogs. What we knew really well was the dogs, what they could do, what they were capable of, what kind of personalities they would go well with. So for our veterans that are incoming for now, because we don't have someone that is um, on the human professional side of things, we take referrals. So they have to have a referral from their therapist uh, psychiatrist, psychologist, or their veteran service officer that says, I think this would be a really good treatment option for this veteran. I'd like you to look into it kind of thing. Um, and once we have that referral, then we send them um, an application for a sidekick. They fill that out. We review it. We do a phone consultation. If they're local, we'll do an in-person consultation with them. Um, they give us access to their current therapist. They have to be working with someone at least. So even if their veteran service officer referred them, we need to know who the therapist is. And then we need to make sure that it's an appropriate avenue for treatment. 
Once the therapist says, yes, I think this is an appropriate avenue for treatment, then we have to gauge um, how much experience this person has with dogs. How much dog do we have to teach them to start? Is this their first or their 20th, you know? And then we have to really determine the needs they're presenting us with versus the needs that they might have in general. So for example, a veteran that feels a dog or a therapist that feels a dog will help reduce anxiety and help a veteran become more social like they used to be, not as concerned about going out in public as they used to be, not as hypervigilant, you know, that kind of thing. Um, the veteran might say, when I start to feel anxious, I start to pace. Well, the more time I spend with that veteran while they're you know, working with different dogs or consulting with me, I might notice that you're a nail biter. You don't start pacing until you've been biting your nails or you've been tapping your finger or you've been twitching your foot. Then you'll start pacing or whatever the case may be. So then I look at the dogs and I say, okay, do we have a dog that's going to like pick up on these signals? Or, you know, if, it, if they have a mobility issue, is it a strong dog that can help with bracing with getting up and down? And that's kind of how that pairing starts. So it starts with a referral then an application, then that kind of consultation just to make sure this is going to be the right direction for both of them, both the dog and the person. Wow. It's an awesome process, even just learning about it. How many veterans and service dogs do you pair on average per year? Ooh. Um, so with COVID kicking our butt through our averages out the window, we had to completely halt all programs. Um, generally, we do one to two pairings per year. Um, and there are some years where four or five dogs will make it through to the next year, and we are able to pair four dogs, but that's more rare. It's really expensive to keep all the dogs in the program. If we have the funding, we will, and we'll see them all the way through if they're meant for it. Um, but on average right now, we're only at about one per year. Mm. Um, this coming year in 2023, we'll probably have at least two to three, I would say, maybe four. Um, that might be pushing it. But uh, yeah, COVID with... 2020 and 2021, we went down to zero because not only did our funding significantly decline, you know, grants were all reoriented to help with, you know, the economy and everything else. So the grants that we were eligible for, we weren't eligible for anymore. Donations took a nosedive. So it took us a while to recover from that. But what was harder was we do this volunteer. So we do this out of volunteer homes and we work in public. We don't have a facility. So I can't run group classes. I can't do one-on-one -on -one training with the volunteers. And so it kind of crushed us for that period. So that's a long answer to say our average would be <laughs> four or five, you know, per year. But right now it's, it's one to two. Okay. Next year I'm aiming two to three at least. But. Well, it gets us into a conversation about the vision that you have for the organization. And obviously, you know, as if any organization or any company, uh, you know, scale is a, a, a balancing act. And, you know, you have a lot that you're balancing within the organization. So tell me about the future. You know, what is the vision that you have for the American Pitbull Foundation as to how many veterans and service dogs you'd like to see paired, you know, at scale at when you're, you know, optimally performing? And then, of course, you know, what that looks like. You mentioned you train out of homes. You know, is there a facility in the future that maybe you want to see? And I'm just getting into all the vision. I don't want to project that onto you, but tell me about the vision of the organization as you see it. Yeah, no, we have uh, big dream energy. Right? <laughs> um, a facility is definitely in our future. And I know that's pretty ambitious for me to say when we don't even have the funding for a facility just yet, but it has to. If we want to have scale if we want to be able to meet the needs of the applications that we're getting because we get probably 100 applications per one dog right. that we have coming in. I mean, it's it's crazy how many veterans um, would very much uh, find healing and progress with the help of a service dog based on where they are in their treatment program, but we just can't meet all the needs. None of us can. Um, this is the same situation through all of these nonprofit programs that are out there or even for-profit service dog programs. We can't keep up. So... Right now, where we can only take on one litter at a time, and a pit bull litter is typically big, anywhere from nine to 13 puppies. So um, if we have the funding for that, and it takes us about $10,000 for each puppy to raise, 12 to 18 months. If we have the placement, the foster placement, that the foster can come to weekly training, can follow the protocols, can learn with us, and can do it, we can keep all those puppies in the program. So if we're running full steam, we have all money on board, the max that we can churn over in a year, per se, is 10 puppies, 10 matches, the way that we're currently doing things if we have the funding and the placement. With a facility, we are looking at changing that dramatically. That's now exponential because we can have 
multiple females at once that have come in from the shelter. We can pull several off off of the the death row list there and bring them into a safe, quiet facility to whelp their puppies and start raising them right away and decrease our washout rate because we control the entire environment for them from start to finish. Um, We have a lot of reasons that volunteers aren't able to fulfill their duties and we have to adopt out perfectly good service dogs because we can't continue them in the program because we don't have placement. So um, unfortunately, we had one volunteer that had breast cancer. Like, there's nothing she can do about that. She didn't back out. You know, she was failing health-wise, and so we had to remove that puppy. We had someone else that just didn't want to follow the rules, and they were ruining their puppy, so we had to wash that one out. But otherwise, if we had a facility, if we had a home base, a location where we could keep our dogs and train our dogs, we would still make use of those foster homes, still make use of those volunteers, but we wouldn't have those dogs that wash out when they're going to be perfectly good service dogs mm. because of things that are outside of our control, not have a build- having a building. So um, that was one of the first things I started thinking about when I moved to Belmont is there's so much space and so much land. Like I would love to take a giant chunk of this land and preserve it and make it kind of our sanctuary where it's quiet and it's peaceful and we can train our dogs and better yet have a place where we can bring our veterans and train our veterans too because right now – We're putting our veterans up in hotel rooms and there's busy lobbies and there's people that they don't want to talk to and decompression is difficult, especially for those traveling out of town. So having kind of that sanctuary, that space, that room, um, we're talking about taking 10 dogs a year and now we're talking about maybe being able to do 50 to 100 dogs a year, depending, you know, with, with the size and with the staff and that kind of thing. So you know, making an exponential dent and having a big impact versus one-offs. Don't get me wrong. One-offs matter. It matters to every veteran that we've placed a dog with, but we really want to, you know, make a big difference. Yeah. Well, especially when you have a proven process, you know, business is about having and delivering on a proven process. So if you can get the support to scale that, you know, it works and you already know how to do it as the professional. So being able to scale that now, you know, the platform exists for stories and connection and, you know, we're getting to capture your story now. And now I hope that this creates connection to you. So when you say you would like a piece of land to build this facility. What size of land are we talking about? Because someone listening right now may say, you know what, that sounds like a cause I'd really love to get behind. And I got this land and I'm willing to do it. So what size of land are you thinking when you say, you know, you have that vision for that facility? Um, I would love, and this is the big dream part, like 20 acres. I know that's not completely necessarily realistic. That's hard to come by. It's hard to find. But um, the reason I want 20 acres, and I would definitely take more, more would be great, is because I think the space and the nature is a very important part of the process in terms of decompression for our veterans and um, decompression for our dogs. We work our veterans really hard. We work our dogs really hard. So that quiet time, that quiet space um, is really important to us. So I'd like to be able to separate them from kind of the rest of the outside world while they're in their training world and they're focused on what they're doing and they have that appropriate decompression. Yeah. Well, being here in North Carolina, you know, we have bases and camps all around us here from Bragg to uh, Columbia to Camp Lejeune. And, you know, so obviously there's a a great need here in the area just because of where we're placed. But of course, veterans, you know, every day, you know, I'm curious again, because I mentioned my background is also in law enforcement. You know, do you also or maybe in the future have a vision for pairing service dogs with those that were in law enforcement or maybe fire and public service of any kind? Yes. So um, I'm like a go big or go home kind of person. And fun fact. When we I couldn't s- tell. <laughs> <laughs> I like to bite off way 20, more than I can 20 chew. 20 acres, 100 dogs a year. Exactly. Yes. Um, big dreams. But uh, when we first started Operation Sidekick, um, I bit off more than I could chew there too. Go, go figure. Uh, I wanted to do um, children with PTSD and veterans with PTSD. Um, that was extremely complicated. And I'm like, of course we can do it. Well, of course you can, but can you do it well? And the answer to that was no, because it was just too broad. So if you ever catch one of our early postcards or early flyers, you'll see that it has both veterans and children on it um, because children are another underserved population in terms of PTSD because often they're really good at hiding it and they're, they're good at hiding neglect and abuse and some other things too, so it's, it's very difficult, um, but service dogs can be incredibly helpful once it is discovered and once there is a commitment there for the child. Um, so yes, to answer your question, I did think early on that eventually we'd be able to expand this because first responders, I'm telling you what, and you know this coming from law enforcement, um, and I got my EMT certification, and I wasn't even in it that long, but the stories of the trauma that people go through and finding life on the other side of that, I don't care how 
numb you think you are to some of the things that you see. And no matter how good you are in that emergency moment to do your job, it takes a toll afterwards. And those those tolls add up and it compiles and it breaks people down. And dogs are one of the best ways to help build people back up. It's not when it's what's going to do it for everyone. But wow, does it have an amazing effect. So I would love to be able to offer it to first responders, paramedics, police officers, especially people that have been through really traumatic experiences. Um, but I don't know when that will be. I would love that. That would definitely make me happy. Well, I do hope that, you know, plugging into our platform here and of course, plugging in with the community that you continue to see that support. And, you know, now again, we've made the connections, but there's a way that we can connect with you here coming up really soon, October 22nd. Yes. So tell us about the Rescue Me 5K. Sure. So the Rescue Me 5K is our annual dog friendly run slash walk. You don't have to run it. Um, but it's also a full event. So it's not just a 5K where you show up and you go home. We do free ice cream. We have free beer for registrants 21 and up. We have free beer for people who bring donations from our Amazon wish list. Um, we have vendors. We have dog supplies. There's a lot of people that just come for the fun. You know, they aren't interested in running necessarily or walking. But uh, the event specifically benefits Operation Sidekick. So we get a lot of funding. This is a public awareness campaign, really, and it's a way to bring the community together and have fun and open their eyes to not just the problem, but the solution we have before us. Um, and it helps provide funding for the sidekicks that we have in training, our service dogs in training. But it's a lot of fun. We have heard over and over again, because we always try to gather feedback, in terms of it being in Charlotte, it was one of Charlotte's favorite 5Ks because you can run with your dog. So I'm really hoping that this is going to be one of Belmont's favorites as well, because this is such a, a great community. I'm really glad to be a part of it. And I think it's going to be a fun place to, to host this event at Stowe Park. So yeah, bring the kids, bring the dogs, get ready for ice cream and pumpkin goodies and Daisy's donuts and lots of dog gear and lots of dog kisses and just fun <laughs> stuff. So Saturday, October 22nd, Stowe Park at what time? Uh, the race kicks off at nine, so come a little bit before, and then the festivities continue until about 11 o'clock. Okay. We Fantastic. do have a costume contest. If you've got a costume for your dog, there will be some really fun prizes. Okay. Well, we're getting pretty close to Halloween there, so I love the idea. Well, um, you know, again, I can't express enough how much I enjoy your mission, so please feel free to use me and our platform as a tool to, again, continue to increase your reach, you know, in Belmont and beyond. And I am just confident that people are going to hear this and want to get behind it. So I hope that people get to meet Sarah, go out and meet Sarah at the Rescue Me 5K, you know, take part, bring your dog, walk, run, whatever it may be. Um, Lulu is again, 130 pounds and she is not vicious, but she gets so excited. She's like me. She gets so excited when she sees the other dogs, she can be a lot. Yeah. So she looks angry and she's not, she just wants to play because she loves other dogs. So I don't know if I'll bring her, but I will definitely personally be there. I'm very much so looking forward to it. And finally, you know, we'll close with this. Why Belmont? Oh, because I love this community. So I moved here a little over a year ago and I've completely fallen in love with it. And it's funny because I'm a city girl by heart. I thought, oh, and you know, nothing is like super close or super convenient. And I love it. I live in a peaceful neighborhood. It's quiet. Everyone I have met so far has been friendly. I have like yet to run into one ugly person <laughs> internally, not externally. I mean, um, so it's really grown on me quite quickly. And you know, my heart is here. My life is here. My kids go to school here. This is my community now. So why not bring the heart of my work right here to the heart of Belmont as well and share this with all of my neighbors and friends and hopefully all of these wonderful people that I'm going to meet as I, you know, dig my roots into Belmont and get to know more people. Well, we're lucky to have you. And again, to have your mission here, it's just an honor truly you know, for you to be in our backyard and for us to be able to uh, continue to be able to support you. Are you seeing already a bunch of registrants or a, a large amount of registrants from Charlotte that know oh, yeah. now you're in Belmont? Lots of, most of our registrants are still from Charlotte okay. and we have people that have come all, all five years prior and they're planning on coming the sixth year, which I love. They collect the race shirts and the medals and um, yeah, so most registrants surprisingly are still from Charlotte. So come on, Belmont, like yeah. let's outshine, <laughs> outshine the Queen City with uh, with participation. Well, people getting to see and connect with you, you know, in, in the beginning of the platform, the heart of it was when you connect with a person, there's a different feeling when you engage with the business. So when I know, you know, Majid from Everyday Market and, you know, I greet him every time I go in and he greets me, I feel a lot better about spending my money there because, yeah. you know, not that I didn't before, but I'm connected to the person and we live in a time now where personal is very powerful. So I'm yes. hoping that people getting to hear you and see you and meet you now through the podcast can say it's not, you know, this big organization that's uninvolved. No, this is Sarah. She's our neighbor. She lives in our community. She shops at our Harris Teeter or Aldi or whatever it may be, you know. So I hope that they say, okay, I really want to connect and engage. And of course, this is our first year 
of many to come, Lord willing, in Belmont. And so thank you for being here. Thank you for your organization. And again, what you're doing for not only these dogs, but the veterans and of course the blessing that you bring to our community by being here. I appreciate that. And I think you just brought up part of the charm too, is that I've always, I'm used to being a wallflower in larger cities. So now that I'm starting to get to know people by name, I mean, that feels really good. I'm supporting this small local business. I'm supporting this person. This is my neighbor. These are my community members. And, and that I think is a charm that, that just really isn't found much elsewhere. So yeah, I'm really excited to be a part of it. Yes. It's a special place. I can't imagine you being a wallflower, but I'll believe you (laughs) if you say it. (laughs) I'm an introvert that's forced to be extroverted. It is what it is. (laughs) Well, thank you for battling through that to uh, reach your extroverted side. Uh, so we're excited again. October 22nd, Stowe Park, 9 a.m. Show up before. And how can we register? We'll, we'll put a link in the notes, but can you sure. share that now? Yeah, rescueme5k.com. Okay. Yeah, rescueme. rescueme5k.com. And if you register before noon on Wednesday, you're guaranteed our race shirt. And we do a different fun race shirt every year. Okay. How many winners do we have? Is it just first, second, third place? So we have age division categories. So we have top overall, and then we have male, female categories, and we break it down by age group. So we've got like 13 under all the way up through, I think, 65 and up. And then, of course, we have our top three dogs. The dogs get prizes too. For finishing? Top three dogs. Fastest? To finish. mm-hmm. or, okay. Fastest. Well, okay. costume contest, cutest, scariest, you know, but for the race, the fastest. I love competition. So <laughs> let's go. Let's make it happen. All right. Well, thank you again, Sarah. Thank you guys for listening. Thank and you. again, we'll see it. you at the Rescue Me 5K. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Building Belmont Podcast. I'm your host, Keanu Trujillo, reminding you to subscribe, rate, and review on your favorite podcast platform. Be sure to like and subscribe if you're watching us on YouTube. And of course, share with a friend, share with a neighbor. We'll see you again next week as we capture more stories, create more connection, and share more information here on the Building Belmont Podcast.